I'm Annie Studebaker and I bring to you an abundance of knowledge from our South Texas rural communities. Follow me as I take you on a journey of inspiration and insight that will offer a deeper connection with people and businesses. Animals are a big part of rural life, so it's only natural that they play a large part when it comes to having fun there. The Corrida de Toros, or bullfighting, is known as a proud Spanish tradition, but you don't have to travel across the ocean to witness the breathtaking action. Every year, Fred Rank and his family welcome thousands of spectators to the Plaza Santa Maria in La Gloria, Texas, just a few miles from Raymondville. We'll pay them a visit and witness the excitement of bloodless bullfights. Okay, we're here with Fred Rank, and uh, tell me a little bit about this bull ring you own. Well, it, we built it here, and it is in the only bull ring in all of the United States. There are a couple of exhibition rings in Northern California that are owned by the Portuguese. But in 49 states, we're the only one that actually puts on events, professional bullfights that are bloodless. And we started it uh, 10 years ago, and it's just blossomed, the Winter Texans pack it. You told me earlier that this is the only bull ring in the United States that's bloodless? Well, period. They're all bloodless. They're all bloodless. Yeah, but there are two rings. I made a mistake when I was before the interview. That in Northern California, that they don't care about anybody coming. It's a Portuguese community, like Carpinteria, and there's mm -hmm. another one. Uh, I don't know what the name of the town is, but they don't care whether you come or not. But it's a, it's a holy day separation when they put on one bullfight a year in each bull ring. Mm -hmm and they built it just for that. They say mass and all that stuff. But we are the only one that puts on continuous events. Bull, professional bullfighters, professional matadors, professional bulls, the real fighting bull. And your bullfighters, where do they come from? Well, Mexico and Spain. And they're professionals on, on the tour, on the circuit. But since my son was the sixth American matador in history, I know most of them. As they, as they come along, and you know, like Lupita Lopez, she's just become the queen out here. You know, the Winter Texans want to see her. So we fly her in every year, and she'll stay for two fights and then go back. And then we bring other, other famous, like Lorenzo Garza, sons coming this year. And there's Enrique uh, Espinosa El Cuate, one of the famous ones from Cadereyta. And then Enrique, Enrique Delgado from Monterey. And we've had uh, real famous bullfighters here. How did you ever get started with bullfighting? In the seminary years ago when I was studying to be a priest. I, I fell in love with bullfighting and, and uh, I went to the Korean War, the end of the Korean War, and I, that's all I thought about after I saw the first bullfight. And when I came back, uh, I decided I was going to be a bullfighter myself. So I went to Mexico and studied and I came back. You have to have a job. It's very expensive. You got to buy your own suits. You got to buy your, your swords. Your, those, those suits are expensive and, and you've got to buy the bulls that you fight when you start off like that as a young uh, novice. And once you've taken your, your, your uh, you get the, the, the carnet, which is a card that allows you to be covered by insurance in case you're wounded, then you're in the Association of Matadors of Mexico. I mean, you, st you still don't get paid anything for fighting. And when they start writing your name in big print, then you like that like with David it went he made it I didn't mm -hmm. like the book that I wrote about him that we've sold I don't know maybe 20,000 copies it says two hearts one sword two hearts one sword both of us were bullfighters but he's he's the only sword so bullfighting has been part of my life for 55 years before the bulls are brought into the ring we put a velcro flower attached to their, where, where the sword would, would go if it was a blood, if, if it was a, a, a blood bullfight. And they do everything, just all three acts, just like they do in the, in the modern bullfighting, controlled by a president who's a retired matador who, so that when nothing is done wrong to the bull, the bull's not injured at all, ever. And when they simulate the kill, they have to go in over the horns instead of with the sword and grab that flower, that simulated death of the bull. But here it's the ballet of life instead of the ballet of death. So I imagine we're here in La, in La Gloria and you have uh, these events take place, place probably when the Winter Texans are here, right? Correct. 
in the fall, winter? Two in, two in January, two in February, and one or two in March. Great. We would definitely have to see that. And um, how many bulls do you have right now? On, on the ranch, it, you know, the next year's group is here. And they, uh, some, most of them were raised here. But we do bring in other, other fighting bulls from Mexico. Um, I have a close friend who was a bullfighter when I was, and he's a, he's a rancher. He raises the fighting bulls. Don Rafael Mendoza from uh, San Fernando. But it's pretty dangerous to go over there now and ship animals at all, you know. So we just are we're depending on our, just to raise them here ourselves. So we probably got, to answer your question, uh, enough for six fights next year, 25, 25 animals. Well, that's a lot. And what happens to the bull afterwards? That's why we call it the ballet of life. You know, the, the rodeo circuits buy them and take them to chase the clowns. You know the poker game that you see in the rodeo arena where the four guys go out and sit at a table playing cards and the bull comes in, stops and looks, and then they'll flip a card and when that movement happens, here he comes. And the last guy holding the table is the guy that wins the pot. And then they have teeter-totters where the bulls are chasing them and, you know, what, four guys. And they have the ring of fear where they'll draw 10 foot square, three rings. And a guy goes to that ring and stands there and tries to, you know, tries to remain there with the bull in the arena. So the last guy that stays in the ring, in, in the ring that he's in, they call it the ring of fear, wins the money. And you, you can dodge him and you can, you know, duck him and do all that sort of thing. But most of the time they'll get you. And they put uh, leather over their horns so they don't kill anybody. But they live a long, beautiful life, well fed. They travel all over the Cheyenne, uh, Cheyenne Rodeo, Pendleton Roundup, Denver, Houston Stock Show. We've got a couple hundred bulls on the circuit out there from here. So we're proud of that. Lo que me motivó pues, era la situación en la que atravesábamos las mujeres en el toro. Eh, un mundo muy difícil, un mundo de hombres. Yo, de hecho, no quería en un principio tomar la alternativa porque yo sentía que iba a dejar de torear. Pero hace un año surgió la posibilidad y viendo que ya habían más matadoras de toros con las que alternar, con las que formar parte con ellas de carteles y, y con la posibilidad incluso de torear en carteles con varones, pues fue como que realizar mi sueño, el sueño de todo torero. Bueno, yo nací en una familia de toreros, eh, desde mi bisabuelo, abuelo, mi padre, algunos tíos y primos, mi hermano actualmente es novillero. Ha sido maravilloso vivir y traerlo en la sangre, en una familia de toreros. Eh, soy la única mujer que lo consiguió, que tomó la alternativa, todos ellos pues se quedaron en eso, en novilleros, es una carrera de verdad súper difícil y afortunadamente a mí Diosito siento que me, me vio con buenos ojos y me permitió vivir ese sueño. Yo empecé a los 11 años a torear, eh, llevo muchos años en esto del toro, sin embargo en el 2009 es cuando llego de Yucatán a la Ciudad de México. A realmente a, a llevar a cabo mi profesión como tal, como una profesión. Eh, yo lo hacía no como un hobby, sino como un trabajo, porque del de, de toro se ganó dinero para vivir y para estudiar. Toda mi familia hemos vivido del toro, pero es hasta el 2009 que me, dedico, que me decido más bien a pisar la Plaza México, a luchar por ese sueño que durante años tuve y que no lo había yo logrado. Entonces fue que me fui de Yucatán a México a intentar, porque en Yucatán no pasaba nada. Porque realmente aunque los toreros somos unos atletas y debemos ser, eh, estar no al 100%, al 300%, porque un golpe nos merma, el miedo nos merma, simplemente le estar en la cara del toro y, y jugarnos la vida hace que mermen todas esas la condición, ¿no? Nos, realmente somos unos atletas, pero no es un deporte, es un arte, un arte maravilloso que inspira a otros artistas a crear bellas obras de, 
como pues, en la música, en la pintura, en la escultura. Entonces podemos ver a la tauromaquia en todas partes, eh, mundialmente, hablando universalmente, en todas las artes. Pues siento, me siento realizada, me siento feliz de estar haciendo algo que me gusta. Siento mucho miedo, siento... De hecho, me siento diferente. Somos tan pocas las mujeres que, que hemos logrado introducirnos en este mundo del toro que hace que el sentirme diferente, hacer algo que no cualquiera hace, el jugarme la vida disfrutando, es una emoción que solo el que lo vive lo puede entender. Es muy difícil explicar, porque miedo lo hay. De hecho, no miedo, pavor lo pavor. Pero es un momento en el que la misma técnica y el valor con el que uno nace y que ese valor crece cuando se dominan los avíos de torear, entonces crece, crece ese valor y uno se crece ante la cara del toro. Es una emoción indescriptible, pero fascinante. Yo tengo tres cornadas en el cuerpo, en el transcurso de, 20, de más de 20 años. Eh, una pudo haber sido mortal, 18 centímetros en la ingle, no tocó afortunadamente ninguna arteria importante, si no, no lo iba a contar, porque me, me sucedió en un pueblo a cuatro horas de la ciudad, en Yucatán, a cuatro horas de Mérida, entonces si me tocaba una arteria importante me iba a desangrar en el camino, no lo sé. Afortunadamente no, no pasó nada, eh, a los 15 días ya estaba entrenando, al mes estaba triunfando en Mazatlán, y todavía con los puntos en el cuerpo, o sea, era una cosa... Pues es que uno nace para esto, es muy difícil que a uno lo obliguen a, a, a torear, porque se necesita de algo especial. Casi 20 años toreando en los pueblos de Yucatán. No era nada importante, no nada trascendía, tres cornadas y nunca se supo nada. Eh, los las plazas de ahí no las podemos clasificar como de primera ni de segunda. Son pueblos, era, le llamamos ahí ferias de pachanga, son como que la otra cara de la moneda. Sin embargo, no, no le resto importancia porque de ahí vengo y de ahí, y ahí me hice. Eso es lo que yo tengo de tablas atrás de mí, que me ha permitido cuando llegué a una plaza de primera y sentí, me sentí súper cobijada porque tanto el terreno como el público conocedor, mi cuadrilla profesional, era otra cosa. Para mí era torear como en copos de algodón, casi casi. Era toda, toda cuidadita y toda bien, y los toros de ganadería, ganaderías de prestigio, perdón. Cosa que yo no conocía. Pero mi primera novillada profesional la toré hace como 10 años. Salí de Yucatán, pero regresaba a Yucatán. Hace tres años que vivo incluso, me tuve que mudar a DF, al DF a, a vivir porque pues ahí está lo, lo importante, ¿no? los contratos, la, la prensa, eh, la prensa especializada, eh, las ganaderías de prestigio, eh, la, bueno, es, el DF es el business, ¿no? el cora, la cuna y el corazón del torero, claro.
event, how many matadors perform? Two. Two, two bulls each. Senior first, then there's, there's the, alternate, the alternante or the alternate bullfighter, the second bull, then he comes back, the third bull, first guy, and then in Lupita's case, she's second, so she kills the, the second and fourth. I mean, symbolically kills the second and fourth. So there's four bulls, two matadors in every event. Hmm. Plus, before that, we have uh, Sonia Chapa and Ray Duran perform flamenco live. It's beautiful. I mean, they, they, these, they appeared in the opera Carmen. They both got dance studios in the valley, and they come out and do the, you know, bulerias and the real flamenco, and people never have seen that before. You know, with the palmas, and, and they're, they're really something to watch. So they put on a half hour show, flamenco. They take us to Sevilla. They said, ladies and gentlemen, you're now in Seville. Thank you, Fred Rain, she goes, and she goes, oh, they start off like that. That's beautiful. So we've got that. Sometimes we have uh, the dancing horses, you know, <clears throat> after the after the bullfight. So it's, it's a, about a four hour show. Tell me a little bit more about your son's accolades. I heard he's uh, very, very good at this. He started when, the story about David is, is a sad story at first. <clears throat> he was born with club feet and they had the kinder procedure performed on his feet. And he started walking and I took him with me to the bull rings in Mexico and to the ranches. And, and uh, he used to just play bullfighter in the backyard. You know, he had, a, he had a yardstick and he had a cloth and he'd go through the whole bullfight. One day we were at uh, a ganaderia de toros, which is a bull ranch in Dr. Cos, which is right here close to the other side of Comales, you know, you, you cross the border, it's Miguel, Miguel Aleman or wherever, but anyway, the ganadero baptized him. So he was his godfather, and he says, David, you want to try it? And David stepped out there and, and taped that first animal of his life, and that's what started it. How you know, old was he? He was, uh, I think, 11. And then, uh, then he started fighting as a noviero and, and he, uh, a novice, matador de novios toros, a novice bullfighter. And that's when he hit the newspapers. You know, People Magazine came, he was going to school in Donna. And they came down there, all kinds of articles were hitting this kid. And I thought, we, we're getting too much publicity, He's not, he doesn't deserve it yet. You know, so we, we kind of backed off that. But the Monitor had a sports editor named Terry Holman. And he was something else. Anything David did was right in the newspaper. You know, it was just really great to help his career along. And then he started, they started writing about David Rank with bigger, bigger print. And then all of a sudden he, he was in Juarez where he'd seen his first bullfight. The, far, the big, big story about that is <coughs> Pepe Luis Vasquez, who I saw when I, back in the 50s, was retiring. And he saw David in the wheelchair. That was when David had the operation. He said, what happened to you? And he said, well, my feet are operated on this before he walked into the ring. He said, where are you sitting? He said, over on the sunny side, the cheap seats. So we rolled that wheelchair down to the first row and Pepe Luis came over there and dedicated the last bowl of his life to that kid, David. He said, you can do anything in life that you set out to do. And David's not supposed to say anything. He said, even be a matador like you? He, Pepe was kind of taken aback, you know. He said, yes, if you try hard enough. 10 years to the day, it happened. Matador de Toros, David ranked right there with Pepe Luis Piazzari. And some, from a wheelchair to the largest bull ring in the world. Okay, David, tell me what motivated you to be a bullfighter? Well, I grew up around it as a young boy. Uh, Went to a lot of bullfights. My dad, he, uh, he traveled during the week and sometimes two or three weeks at a time. And we lived in a place uh, in El Paso where Juarez was very active, a lot of bullfights. And so he would come home and Sunday afternoons we went to bullfights. And knowing the people and being around it, you know, it would be an all day event going to the bullfights. And it just continued all my life. And when I was young, I couldn't, I wasn't, physically able to play basketball and all those sports because my feet were, weren't, weren't well. So, but I could, I could, I learned how to fight bulls and, and I was able to do that, you know. So it just, one thing led to another and it was, 
that snowball down the hill, as you should, should right. say, and it just kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger. You have a whole lot of articles and uh, write-ups about your amazing corridas. Right. <laughs> but uh, tell me about a few. Tell me a couple. Well, I had good ones and I've had bad ones, and I remember the, all of them just about the same. Um, it would take you a long time to get to the point where you think you got it understood, you think you got it figured out, and, and it took me, even after I was a full matador, when I really made everything click, uh, all the right, everything happened right, the bulls responded right, I responded right to the bull, and it was in a little plaza, well it was big, big size plaza, but a small crowd of people, not, not a big uh, crowd of people. But everything clicked, and inside my heart, I knew that was my best fight to that point. And I was already a full matador. But there's always something in those bullfights that, well, I could have done this better. I could have, this could have happened differently. You know, I just didn't finish that series just the way I wanted to. And in that fight, it, you know, everything went, to me, perfect. Um, bullfights like in a fight in Madame Morris, you know, I, everything was going great. And I let the crowd get in my head, and I, you know, they're cheering me on, and I don't know if they weren't heckling me, but they were, and I just got a little cocky with them. Yeah, I'll show you, you know, and I sided the bull, and he charged me from halfway around the ring and picked me up by my ankles and gave me the worst beating of my life. So, you know, you, you remember those, you know, and then uh, just the little ones in a little town in Honuta, Tabasco, that took, uh, three ferries to get through all the rivers to get to this little town and uh, sleep in the rental car because there was no hotels in this little town. Uh, 105 degrees and 100,000 percent humidity and you just suffering, you know. But you remember that too. I mean, there's so many special uh, fights that I had over the years and, uh, and a lot of those that, uh, well, we don't really remember too bad. You just kind of, it was, it was this hard day, you know, whether it be me not up to par, the bulls not up to par, or uh, the weather bad, or you know, it all takes the experiences. You're watching BTX TV. Mi nombre es Raquel Martínez, soy de San Diego, California. Eh, viví en México 30 años. Me hice novillera profesional en México y luego me hice matadora de toros y fui la primera mujer que recibe la alternativa y en Tijuana, Baja California, en el, la Plaza del Toreo, perdón. Y fue una corrida, una alternativa con todos los honores y fui la primera mujer que haga eso en la historia de la tauromaquia en México, en España, o sea mundial. Yo llegué a un nivel y me detuvieron, pero yo abrí la puerta para las demás mujeres que sea más fácil, porque ahora hay muchas mujeres en los toros, hay muchas novilleras y hay más que quien ser matadoras. Y yo me siento feliz saber que me tocó en la vida a mí abrirles la puerta y es más fácil para todas las demás que vengan. Mi papá me llevaba a los toros a Tijuana, yo de chamaca, a ver las corridas. Y este, a mí me gustó porque a mi papá le gustaba. Y yo vi a torear, pero, y de allí yo iba con mis amigas de teenager a las plazas en Tijuana. Y en Tijuana este, siempre han llevado carteles importantes, matadores importantes, toros buenos de buena procedencia. Entonces Tijuana tiene muy buenas corridas de toros y de allí nació, viendo Torial, nace el amor por Torial. Comencé en, toreando en, en California, en Estados Unidos, en Tijuana, en las plazas del norte, que es Mexicali, Uh, Nogales, Ensenada, Ensenada, Baja California, Tijuana, en festivales. 
comencé a torear, torear festivales y al rato este, yo quería más, yo quería hacer algo más profesional, sentía yo que los novios chicos me aburrían, yo quería más y más grandes y por eso me fui a México para a ver qué podía hacer de carrera, como carrera de torera yo, pero jamás, jamás pensé que iba a llegar al nivel que llegué mundial. Muy bonito, una vida hermosa. He conocido muchos, muchas personas maravillosas, países hermosos, costumbres diferentes y este, estoy muy agradecida con la, el ambiente del toro que siempre me ha tratado muy bien. Uh, me enseñó a vivir y, y luego este, mucha gente me dice, ay, pero ¿cómo toreas? Es muy peligroso. Y, 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 toreaba, tenía mis temporadas, y, 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 y llegaba a San Diego, California, me regresaba para visitar, está con mi familia. Y me acuerdo, le pregunté por una amiga, oye, ¿qué le pasó a mi amiga tal? Fíjate que falleció. Uh, estuve en el hospital, necesitó sangre y tenía sida y murió. Yo, ¿cómo? Bueno, oye, mi amigo, ¿dónde está? Fíjate que falleció. ¿Pero qué le pasó? Tuvo un accidente, en el baño se resbaló, se pegó en la nuca y se mató. ¿Me y a mí siempre me están diciendo que no torees, es muy peligroso. No, de nada. Cuando te toca, te toca. No, no, no es el toro, vaya. Por eso nunca le tuve miedo a torear, no, no, no tuve miedo a la muerte. ¿Qué países has toreado? Pues en, en, en México, en, en uh, a ver, Guatemala, Costa Rica, Panamá, en Perú toreé muchas tardes. Me, enc me encantó ir a Perú. Fui a España y me lastimé en la primera corrida. Y me regresé y ya, yo ya se me quitó las ganas de torear, pero siempre sigo. Mi corazón, mi afición son los toros. Tengo un hijo que vive en San Diego, California. Nada más tuve un hijo. Y tengo una nietecita y un nietecito y mi, y mi nuera, que es muy linda. Y mi hijo, ya vente, mamá, ya vente con nosotros. Voy a San Diego, sí estoy allí. Pero cuando siento el toro, ay, me desespero. ¿Cómo quisiera estar toreando toda la vida? Toda la vida. Pues lo principal para, hacer to para torear y estar en el rol es tener valor. Con valor lo demás se aprende. Uno puede, un, un, una persona puede tener mucho arte, mucha técnica, muy bonito con el toro, pero si no tiene valor para hacer esas cosas, no puede torear. Es lo principal con valor y lo demás se aprende. Da más miedo como profesional, da más miedo no estar bien. Da más miedo ser el ridículo. Eso da miedo. Y tantito da miedo el toro. Pero el gusto de torear acapara todo. Da miedo, no vaya yo a estar mal. Eso sí me asustaba. No vaya yo a estar mal. No vayan a escribir que Raquel Martínez estuvo mal. Y eso me iba a matar. ¿no? Eso no. Eso sí me da miedo. Tenía que estar bien en todas. How long does a bullfight last? Each bull about 25 minutes. And you can only fight them once. In that 25 minute period, they learn more than you've learned in your to whole life. They know, they know you're there, and you're there following the movement of the cape, and you're not moving, you're just dominating them with that piece of cloth. A lot of people think, well, he's got a sword there. That sword's wooden. That sword's aluminum, you know, that they use, because a killing sword is heavy when you're fighting, then you go change it and, and dispatch the bull in Mexico or in, in Spain or wherever you're fighting to kill bulls. But here, they just use a wooden, wooden sword to extend the cape to, to make a pass. So there's more target. But they learn in 25 minutes what you've learned in 20 years. That's how intelligent they are. Well, maybe now I can find out the truth about something. What? Does red really infuriate that bull? No. He's colorblind just like a deer, or just like any other animal. You know, cats are not colorblind, but uh, uh, the, the fighting bull is colorblind. They, well, you got a red suit over there. 
So this myth is not true. That's not true. You, know, <laughs> you, you can wear red and walk around anywhere you want to walk. He's not going to come after that. He's going to come after the movement. And that's why I didn't wear red today. <laughs> <laughs> that's funny. <laughs> I won't wear red on the first either. Well, that's interesting. I, I really thought that they red is the only color they could see. No. Tell me the size of that bull ring. It's 90 feet in diameter fighting area. And uh, we have the box seats that are on the ground level, which are the most popular seats. Do you think I would want to sit there? I'd be scared to no, sit so close. No, it's, it's, all, <laughs> it's, it's all steel and reinforced, you know, but you've got an opening. How tall over. is the wall? Well, it's five feet, but then you're sitting up higher and, and you, you're looking through like they can't get through there. They've tried. That's enough to give me a heart attack. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, well, it, I may just have to sit in one of those boxes then. Well, we'll get the camera right down there in the press box. You know? oh, okay. Okay, I'm looking forward to seeing this. I'm so excited. I'm going to bring my little boy too. So. Good. And there's, there's one big animal. The other ones are the young heifers that are going to be bred. So we're testing them for their eyesight, their bravery, their alertness, and, and how well they stay in the cape. And, and if they don't pass, off to the slaughterhouse they go into hamburger, but I've never lost one yet. That's because of that big bull I showed you out there. That pure Spanish blood. Yo soy Enrique Delgado. Enrique. Tengo 29 años. Cumplo este año cumplo 29 años de matar todos. Pues ya tenemos aproximadamente dos años en, en esto del toreo, yo soy aspirante a novillero, ya no soy matador de toros y pues estamos echándole muchas ganas, ¿no? mucha afición y pues venir aquí y, y que se divierta la gente. ¿no? De mi parte, que ya estoy pasando la estafeta aquí a mi hijo y que, este, y que ojalá viniera mucha gente, es un espectáculo muy, muy sano, muy, muy este, donde no hay sangre aquí en Estados Unidos y ojalá pudiéramos este, que, viniera, que viniera mucha gente y, y esto fuera una gran fiesta. ¿no? We've got uniforms here that have a story to tell. Yeah, tell the, me when he used, your son used the maroon and the blue uniform. Tell me those stories. The vino y oro, which is the maroon, they call it vino y oro was for his doctorate when he was 18 years old. He became the, first, the, youngest American, the youngest American in history and the only American since then, 1981. He wore that suit. And then the blue and, and gold is where he went into the world's largest ring, Mexico City, and confirmed his doctorate, you know, by getting the PhD. That means, they, see, they, they have these degrees. And when you confirm your alternativa, you're, you have to confirm it in the world's largest ring. So the, you, you have to go to school for this then? Well, the schooling is what you're doing on the road, fighting, on the tour. And then you get tour. a PhD when you graduate? Yeah. It's a doctorate in bullfighting. That gold stuff on these uniforms, it almost looks like gold. Is it gold? It is, 10 karat gold. 10 karat gold. Beautiful uniforms. Beautiful, amazing. Yeah, and the, there's families that make them in Spain and Mexico. The best ones come from Spain, and the families have been doing it for hundreds of years. Give me an idea, what does each uniform, más o menos, cost? Well, you know, when you, when you first start off, you, you buy a used one and have it tailored to you, and you can get those used ones for a couple thousand dollars. If you buy a brand new one, as in the case of his doctor, we get, couldn't let him buy a borrowed or a used suit, five grand, five thousand, and that's what they both cost. And the capes are like eight hundred dollars a piece, a big work cape. The capote de brega is a work cape. You know, when the bull first comes in, you face him with that cape. That's about $800. The small cape, which we call the money cape, which you do all the intricate work and domination with, they're like 300 The slippers that they make, you know, handmade for that, yes. they're $100. A, a shirt that they wear is 100 bucks. And do you still have your son's uniform all when he was a little boy? Yeah, it's still, it's over there. It's yeah. in the case. It's in the case, the first one that he wore. Great, we'll get to see that. Tell me about your museum. It's taken a lot of years. There's a lot of, uh, a lot of things in here that are very, very, uh, you know, precious to me. I mean, photos of matadors that are now no longer with us. Um, but every grate is in here on the walls. 
from all the way back early, you know, Carlos Arusa from Mexico and, and Luis Procuna and Pepe Luis Vasquez and Rodriguez and, I think, and Lorenzo Garza. You can just keep on going. Those names, Manolo Martinez, who was one of the greatest, Eloy Cavazos from Monterey. Cavazos Boulevard, Martinez Boulevard, Monterey, the two big guys from down there. But most of them are gone. And then we've got the new ones. My picture's got to go up and they bring it, so we put it up for them, you know. Ani, qué alegría y qué gusto que hayas venido al festejo, porque es un festejo de altísimo nivel. Yo me lo he pasado feliz porque he traído a mi hija. Mi nombre es Paco Santoyo. Yo fui torero profesional, bueno, nunca me he retirado, no, ya no lo hago. Y soy ganadero de toros bravos también. Y mi hija, pues genéticamente ya salió este, torera, ¿verdad? Apenas está empezando, está muy tiernita y está empezando. Mi mujer que nos acompaña también, ella es una gran aficionada. Cuando yo me casé le gustaban mucho los toros, ella es médico, oftalmólogo. Pero por el lado de, su, de la familia de mi mujer también hay artistas. Entonces ya la niña pues es artista por genética, ¿verdad? Así es. Es algo inexplicable el poder, poder tener un animal, como quien dice, dominado, de esa manera, sin tener que agarrarlo. Simplemente tú, el toro y nadie más, es algo que, que me llena, ¿no? Es una sensación indescriptible el poder dominar a una fiera con tanta facilidad a través de un engaño y poder someterlo y llevarlo hasta donde uno quiera, existiendo un gravísimo peligro que le puede costar a uno la vida. Uno da un mal paso o el toro lo llega a levantar, cae uno de cabeza y se murió. Entonces, cuando hay ese riesgo, cuando maneja esos niveles de adrenalina, es una sensación única la que se siente como torero. ¿eh? Así es, así es, Andy. I was born in Phoenix, Arizona, and back in the late 50s and early 60s, bullfighting was very popular along the border. And so I would go down when I was a teenager and see bullfights. And I got interested. I had a chance one day when they had some small animals that some disc jockeys were going to do, try to do a comedy bullfight, and they didn't want to fight the bulls when they saw them. So they said, anybody in the crowd can come down. And I didn't really know much about it, but I wanted to try. And uh, so when I did that, uh, an empresario from a small Mexican town came and said, hey, do you want to be a bullfighter? And I said, yeah, yeah, yeah. And so he put on bullfights in Sonora and Sinaloa. And then I, that's really where I began to learn about it. And that, that started about 1962, more or less. And in, in that time, the first bull I killed was in 1963. The last bull I killed was in Spain last month. Last month? Yep. I probably, so how many bulls have you killed? Uh, you know, I don't keep count that well, but it should be over 300. The word matador, that means killer. That's right. So, so what do you call a bu bloodless bullfight? Oh, like today? Well, in Spanish you call it a corrida incruenta. Incruenta? Incruenta Corrida means, incruenta. right? Yeah, oh, no. interesting. I have fought in, in addition to, Mex to Texas and California, where they have bloodless bullfights also in California. Hmm. I fought in Mexico, uh, uh, Ecuador, uh, Colombia, Spain, and France. And one time when I was in Peru on business, I was in a tienta, much like today, with, uh, with cows. Right? Let me ask you, what does it take to be a professional bullfighter? Well, a lot of dedication. Um, you know, you, you... Now remember, I'm an amateur, right? I, I, I don't bullfight for money. In fact, usually I pay for the bull when I fight in other countries. So what's the difference between a professional and an amateur? 
Well, somebody who decides they want to make it a living, and depending on what country it is, uh, you can just basically say, I, I want to be a professional bullfighter. So you start out uh, with what they call a novillero, a matador de novillos toros, uh, a matador of younger bulls. And then you will take a ceremony called the alternativa, where a full matador will go through a little ceremony with you and you then can fight four-year-old bulls, four and five-year-old bulls. So, and down below, in the first steps, you have a lot of what you might call aspiring novieros, right? But, but I never really did the, the two professional grades. Why not? Well, like I said, I just, I, I, uh, I saw too many things in the bullfighting world. You know, I was, I guess, kind of a romantic and I wanted the more pure side, you know. This adrenaline-driven moment, describe it. When you get out there and you're ready to see the bull. The bullfighters have this saying, you know, it's the gusano eating away at your stomach and your stomach, you know, the gusano. All your life, you can't quit. You know, even David, even after being wounded and hurt bad as it was, he'll still get out there. But, you know, the first pass, the fear is gone. But there is fear. There's fear that, you know, you, you, you can't move. What am I doing out here? You know, what am I actually doing out there? What am I doing here? This is ridiculous. But after that first pass and you see that he's good, he's gonna come and then, then it just goes on. You remember the things that you were taught. But you know, like Lupita, she just, I, I see her on her knees. There's a picture of her right over there on that fridge over there with her on her knees, passing that bull right by her face. <clears throat> Some of them have this, uh, this tremendous desire, you know, to really do things that inspire the people. People just kept, that's why they come to see her. She's almost suicidal. You know, she'll drop on her knees just as he's about to arrive and then throw him over her shoulder with that cape. I mean, she's, she's something else. What makes the bull follow the cape and not the body of the person? Well, the body's not moving. They follow movement. Oh. The body is standing still, you know. You know, there's, there's the stand, receiving, passing, and letting him leave. The three things in making the pass. Receiving the bull, you know, letting him pass, and then getting him to pass correctly, and close, and then leaving. Sometimes we'll get out there and stand on a chair in the middle of the ring and turn a big bull loose. And if you don't move, he won't, he won't come after you. Like the poker game with the, with the clowns. They're sitting there, if you start flipping those cards around, he, here he comes. He sees that, you know. He's got, he can outrun a quarter horse, first hundred yards, standing start. Their hooves are real small, and they're really, they can really move fast. But when you have to slow them down, that's what we do, slow them down, the momentum with that big cape, boom. And he, and he starts into the cape like that. His horns are trembling. That, that's enough to scare you right there. But you overcome it. Well, I guess if I were to get out there and pass out, the bull would hurt me. <laughs> we'd, we'd catch you. <laughs> you know? yeah. That'd be the end of me. Well, we're looking forward to seeing this event, definitely. Well, it's going to be a lot of fun. It's and it's supposed to be a happy, happy time, you know. Definitely. So. The courage that these bullfighters have is truly amazing. I invite you to come visit the Santa Maria Bullring so you can enjoy the adrenaline-driven bloodless bullfights. Until next time.